Hello everybody, welcome to Ask Me Anything for Thursday, December 2nd. I can't believe we're in December, by the way. 2021 for the CrossFit Lynchman Private Track Facebook group. Members submit questions, other members upvote them, and the most popular ones get answered live each week. So I've got the top three here open on my desktop. Got some thoughts scratched down. Pardon me, I'm still recovering from a cold that my kids gave me. <coughs> Last few days I've been quite sick. Today I feel 100% better, so it's nice to be kind of back to normal. The baby is asleep, so we're going to try to get this done whilst the baby sleeps. Here we go. So the first most upvoted one was about intentional interference. It was from Bridget B. Can you talk about interference? Um, I hear you mention it often. I don't really feel like I understand what it is, um, why is it important, is there an advantage in including it in the programming, etc., etc. She's poked around a bit, hasn't found a satisfying answer. Bridget, we've got you covered. So basically what we're talking about in just layman's terms with interference, specifically with regards to working out a programming, is you can have movements that are complementary or movements that interfere with one another. So for example, running and pull-ups would be complementary. They wouldn't interfere. You're obviously using your you know, aerobic system, I guess, depending upon the pace that you're running, and largely lower body. Yeah, I know you're swinging your arms and your midline's engaged when you run. I get it. But largely a lower body activity. You get to the pull-up bar, an upper body dominated pulling motion. You know, you need energy for both, you need oxygen for both, you know, so you do have those, some systems are being used in both activities, yes, but we would categorize those as complementary movement patterns and not ones that have a large degree of interference. Another example, and, and a lot of times, potential rabbit hole, and a lot of times with programming, you're doing the right thing by trying to often have workouts that have complementary movement patterns because you're going to allow the athlete to keep moving, to not slow down, um, to resist fatigue as much as possible, to resist muscular failure. And if you keep the athlete moving, you keep them doing work, well then at the end of that workout, ideally they'll have accomplished that work in a faster period of time than if there was a lot of interference. So if you do the work faster, you're producing more power. In general, we know that in a high power output, the average power that you produce for a workout, if you can keep it higher as compared to lower, you're on a good path to getting fitness results improvement. So that's what we want to do. On average, if we program and create things on a regular basis that plummets the athlete's power into the toilet, intensity dips down, we're not going down the path we want to results. Now there are reasons to do that every now and then. Hmm? Now we're kind of getting into interference, but you want to make sure that you're doing that intentionally and as part of the design of your programming and you just didn't make a mistake, you didn't realize that you're just creating these low power output, high intentional interference workouts. So an example of a workout, uh, another, well, I almost got ahead of myself again a high intentional interference workout would be JT, hero workout. And JT is 21.59, let me get the order right, of handstand push-ups, ring dips, and push-ups. So now if we go back to our previous example of running and pull-ups, running, lower body locomotion, pull-ups, upper body pulling. Ideally, you can see how those two are, are more complementary than uh, providing interference with one another. Well, now let's think about JT. On the handstand push-up, a simplification is just to say it's, it's pressing. Yes, you're pressing overhead, but you're pressing chest, shoulders, triceps, traps, midlines engaged, lats are involved, you're pressing. Now, on the dip, yes, you're pressing in a different direction, but you're still pressing after doing the pressing of the handstand push-ups. And on the ring dips, even though it's in a different direction, shoulders, traps, lats, chest, triceps. 
Then the last movement is push-ups, pressing once again. Yes, in yet a, another direction, but we're using everything that we were using before. So there's never a break on the musculature involved. There is a huge degree of interference, and in JT, it's intentional. You know, at least when you're running, again, I know that your body is deciding where to give oxygen and where to give energy, but your pulling muscles of the upper body are getting a significant recovery while you're running and vice versa. But in JT, there's just no rest for the wicked. I mean, you're getting it hammered over and over again. So on something like JT, for most athletes, that it's not just a perfect wheelhouse workout, then, you know, most people are, are going to need to take significant rests, which will overall lower the intensity, right? Because if you don't, you're going to reach this muscular total failure, and then you're going to stand around for a long period of time until you can recover and start using those pressing muscles again. So that's a nice little encapsulation of complementary movements versus movements that interfere with one another. Another classic movement, even though it's so painful start to finish, is Fran. Fran is complementary movement patterns in a beautiful rep range, in a beautiful loading, and since they are complementary, that allows a lot of people to keep their intensity so darn high for so long because the thruster, while yes, there is upper body involved in the thruster, and there's obviously upper body involved in the pull-up, the thruster is largely not a upper body movement. It is the barbell is going overhead, hopefully, if you're doing the thruster properly, because of the significant leg drive that you have a, that has occurred in that front squat to explosively standing up. And as the barbell shoots off the shoulders, the arms are basically a follow through, if you will, from what happened with the midline and the legs. It's not so much a squat, stop, press. It's a below body, uh, a lower body drive. Then you've got the upper body pull. So those two are a very nice pairing. Diane would be another beautiful complementary movement pattern as well. You've got a pull from the ground, a lower body pull with a deadlift, and then you're going to go ahead and invert yourself and you have an upper body press with the handstand push-up. So there's a lot of beautiful classic CrossFit workouts that have complementary movement patterns because they're very beneficial. Uh, they develop beautiful athleticism and work capacity and they allow the athlete to keep their power up, but generally speaking, higher as opposed to lower, and that's a good thing. However, life has no regard for that, and life will inevitably throw things at you that are not complementary. You may have to do several tasks that are very similar and repetitive and require the same musculature over and over again. And so if we want to be truly well-rounded and we're training for life, and those aren't just empty words and catchphrases, which they're not, well then yes, we are going to throw in workouts from time to time by design that have intentional interference, even though they will most likely be lower power producing workouts than complementary movement patterns. That doesn't mean that they don't have value, that they're not necessary, and they're not critical to building a well-rounded athlete that will be able to perform in the real world. So that is why we do what we do, and that is hopefully helps clarify some things in your mind about what we mean when we say interference. Okay, let's see. The next one was from Patrick S. Let me scroll, and I always like to say that it's not me. I'm not the Patrick S. that asked this question. Okay, here we go. Basically talking about the classic linchpin heavy day at a high heart rate. Uh, what's the benefit? Basically wants to know. How does it play into functional fitness in daily life? Fantastic question. The heavy day at a high heart rate is beautiful. And it's one of many ways to not just develop fitness, but to develop strength. Strength doesn't have to look like just a classic 5x5 five five back squat with a dedicated 3-4 to four minutes rest or a 7x1 deadlift or whatever it happens to be. Those are classic heavy days, and we do them all the time because they work, and they work really well. However, one of the most, 
I could go on a long rant about this too. One of the, one of the most important things about CrossFit and CrossFit programming is that variance component, constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. It's so easy to think about the functional movements, right? Squat, press, dead, all this cool stuff and the intensity. That variance, that little part at the beginning of that sentence, constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. Intelligently designed variance is one of the most powerful and beneficial things in CrossFit. Uh, and the heavy day, the high heart rate kind of rolls into that. So first of all, it should be, I would think, relatively easy to see in application how this plays out in the real world. I guess maybe depending upon what you do for a living, okay? But before we get into that, the lead-in, would I would say, is something we used to say all the time at Level 1 seminars, which is segmented training leads to segmented capacity. And we don't want that in CrossFit. We don't want segmented capacity. And Here's what I mean by that. It can mean a couple things. Segmented capacity could mean Again, it's interesting in 2021, so many things are obvious now because CrossFit has changed the landscape of fitness that there are things right now that everyone sees as universal truths. And of course you would do it. Like, Of course you would back squat regardless of your age. Who wouldn't back squat? Of course you would clean and deadlift. Who wouldn't do that? Those are such critical movements. That was not always the case. When I was first getting into this in 2005, most regular gyms you went to, there was no functional fitness going on. People weren't squatting or deadlifting unless you went to a strictly powerlifting gym. What people did at the gym was segmented training. So instead of back squatting, doing a compound multi-joint movement, they would break it down to its little parts and they would do leg press and leg curl and leg extension, maybe some abduction and adduction or something else and think that that all those pieces parts of single joint isolation machine based movements i could kind of put them together and i'd have a decent back squat no you will not you cannot just leg press just leg extend just leg curl do all this segmented training and think that you're going to excel at the compound movement it does not work that way segmented training leads to segmented capacity but the inverse is not true if you do the back squat, the compound multi-joint total body head to toe strength building movement, you will have no problem on the leg press. You will have no problem on the leg extension or the leg curl. So it works one way, but it doesn't work the other. <coughs> Pardon me. Toe just getting over cold. So again, in keeping with that segmented training leads to segmented capacity, we don't want to build segmented athletes. Or another thing is, if we just do our, and this was another thing that used to happen all the time back in the day, back before Cross to Change the Landscape is, you do your quote-unquote weightlifting, whether that was your leg extension, your leg curl, of course you'd rest one minute between sets, or your bench press, resting a minute between sets, your dumbbell flies, resting a minute between sets. Then once that was done, then you do your quote-unquote cardio in a totally separate section that was by itself. 30 minutes on the life cycle, 30 minutes on the Stairmaster, 30 minutes on the treadmill, probably not sprinting either, right, or doing intervals, kind of steady state, lower intensity. And you didn't mix in other modalities with it. You didn't do the treadmill and then do some power cleans. Like it was just steady state cardio. It was segmented training. And so if you separated your weightlifting, and it was largely single joint isolation movements, machine based, then you segmented your aerobic conditioning, your stamina, your, um, your, what am I trying to say here? Basically, yeah, your, uh, your metabolic conditioning was on that, on that machine. Well, if it's always segmented, what would happen if somebody went back in a time machine and then had you do a workout where the two were combined? You're going to run and then do some weightlifting and then run and do some weightlifting and then run and do some weightlifting like a three round per time. Athletes would implode because they weren't used to training that way. They were segmented their training. And you can't segment your training and then think you can smash running and weightlifting together and have it work well. It doesn't work that way. You need to actually do that in your training. Whatever you do all the time, you get good at. And so what we do all the time 
this constantly varied function moves at high intensity in a intelligently designed degree of variance to give you this broad capacity. So I want you to have the ability to lift heavy weight while under some sort of aerobic stress, while under some sort of metabolic conditioning that you have to do. Because if you don't do that, you won't just magically be able to do it if the opportunity ever comes up. So I don't want people to be able to lift heavy weights just at a low heart rate with two to four minutes of static rest. I want people to also be able to lift decently to moderately heavy loading while doing other activities. There's tremendous benefit there. And if we think about, and I guess, I guess it also depends upon what you have to do for a living. My father's an accountant, was a lifelong accountant. I don't know if he's ever actually had the need for a heavy day at a high heart rate. In his actual, he goes to the grocery store, goes home, sit at the desk, work the calculator, that's that. Fantastic. If you were police, military, firefighter, first responder, you most likely don't need me to tell you why this is important. Anyone who's done a down man drill in the military, where there's some 200 pound buddy of yours on the ground, you've already been running around doing Lord knows what, and you're already tired, you're already exhausted, you're already fatigued, you're already who knows how long into this evolution, 30 minutes or 30 hours, and then all of a sudden, there's a 200 pound down man that might have 30 to 40 pounds of gear on, and somebody says, go ahead and move that person 800 meters over there. Well, there's a heavy day at a high heart rate in a real world application that could, no joke, actually be the difference between life and death and save somebody's life, depending upon what you do for, for a living. Now, I'm sure there are other applications that are less dramatic that could occur at a construction site or just moving heavy objects around while you're doing other work as well. The heavy day at a high heart rate is 100% functional, 100% real world application, and a very, very valuable training tool. And that's why we're a fan of them. Uh, let's see. And also, let's see, you know, while you're out doing the runs, for example, we just did the heavy day at a high heart rate that was three rounds for time, 800 meter run, 10 front squats at. I want to say was it 60% of your one rep max? And so while you're out doing that 400 meter run, I'm also kind of forcing you to take, let's say roughly four minutes rest, depending upon how long that run takes you. And while you're out on that run, that since you did 10 front squats at 60% of your one rep max, you're most likely not setting a new PR on that 800 meter run. And that's okay, that's good. It's nice that it's a nice jog because that's what you're going to need to have it be to get back and be able to squat that weight. And when you're out in that nice jog, you happen to be developing your aerobic system more than you would be if you just stood around. Again, both have value, right? But developing your aerobic system is mission critical because your recovery and your ability to lift heavy weight again is largely dependent upon your aerobic system. So it's nice to develop that. So again, the heavy day at a high heart rate, it's a beauty. It's, it's, it's a beauty. And it's, it's nice. That's a great question that Patrick asked because it ties in very well to the final question that we're going to uh, touch on from Ken, who asks about different muscle fibers, fast twitch and slow twitch. So on something like the heavy day at a high heart rate, when you're under that barbell, it's largely your fast twitch muscle fibers because those are the ones that are better producing large amounts of force. And that's what you're going to need. You're not going to need a, something that produces a low amount of force when you're lifting heavy weight. Then you go out for the run and you're largely recruiting the slower muscle fibers. And you're also working the energy system, which is going to help replenish and recover the fast twitch muscle fibers. So when you go back into squat, you're ready. So there's all these beautiful little little wizard pepper, little magic happening in there to make great athletes. So it's good stuff. Okay, that leads very nicely, as I just kind of alluded to, to Ken's question here. Ken J, where are you, sir? Okay, here we go. Can you explain fast twitch versus slow twitch muscle fibers and their test movements that help indicate kind of what you have? You know, can they be trained or improved? Wonderful question. 
So here we go. Let me get my notes in order. So, Ken, this is an oversimplification because going more into a rabbit hole just isn't necessary. You can go ahead and do a little little Google foo and get yourself down as many rabbit holes as you want on different types of muscle fibers and spend probably all day there. But I don't know it will it won't pay as much dividends when you walk into the gym that night as you think it will. So I'll give you what you need to know here to, to you know make you um, appropriately informed. So let's say your slow twitch muscle fibers, type 1, your fast twitch are type 2. Bear in mind that those can be broken down even more, that there's not just type 1, nothing else, just type 2, nothing else, no subcategories, no nothing. But for the purposes of this discussion, it's perfectly useful to say type 1, slow twitch muscle fibers, type 2, fast twitch. And then let's talk about what the difference is, which can you tell maybe if you have some more developed than others, and can they be improved? So, in general, your slow twitch muscle fibers are going to be low force producing, and they can be, in that effort that they're doing, the work that they can doing, can be done for a very long time domain. So in general, lower intensity, longer time domain. You're going to go out and jog for 30 minutes, good. You're going to do something at a pace that is sustainable for a very long time. We're talking about your slow twitch muscle fibers. If you're talking about explosive activity, uh, lifting very heavy weight for only a few reps, uh, doing some sort of activity that's so intense that it is not sustainable, and therefore the time domain is very short, then we're talking about your largely your fast twitch, your type 2. And so it can be easy just to assess yourself of an athlete and, and figure out, do you have a, a preference or does your data lead you to believe like, oh yeah, I'm much better at a long, slow or a light and long kind of a thing than, than a short and heavy or the, the converse can be true. Like, hey, I came from a powerlifting background Heavy weights all day long, fantastic. Give me threes and fives, give me singles. You ask me to go do the filthy 50s, mm -mm, no way, that's not going good. So there can be some, some ways to assess this as well, also if you fear the 5K. You want to increase your fast twitch muscle fibers? There's a lot of stuff that we do as well that you could do that if that's what you identified as something that needed to be done for you specifically. Power lifting, Olympic lifting, sprinting, all of those things are going to be your friend if you've identified that the fast twitch fibers need development. And the opposite could be true. You need to go and develop a bit more on the on the slow twitch side of the house. Longer, slower, lower intensity, developing that kind of a longer aerobic capacity, that's going to treat you very well. Uh, let's see. I also wrote down here that Playing with recovery is key as well, depending upon what you need. So I might have mentioned this when I talked about Patrick S.'s question on the heavy day at a high heart rate and how we're working the aerobic system out on those, like for example, 800 meter runs between the sets of 10 front squats because you're up to, they say that up to 80% of an athlete's ability to recover is based on their aerobic system. So when you fatigue those high force producing muscle fibers that allow you to do that really heavy squat clean, that big snatch, deadlift, whatever it happens to be, and you just can't do it right again, right? You have to recover before you can do it again. You'll hit muscular failure. Well, your ability to recover can be up to 80% based upon your aerobic capacity. So if you aren't conditioned and you don't have good conditioning, all your precious strength just fades away because it takes you longer than it should to recover and to continue that work, which is why conditioning is so darn important. And heavy weight and lifting heavy at the exclusion of conditioning does not produce a well-rounded, useful athlete in the real world. And so 
uh, it's a very big deal to get out there and make sure you're working that, that aerobic base as well. So let's say that you are, you know, if we oversimplify fast twitch and slow twitch to endurance, there's your slow twitch, you can go long. And then fast twitch is speed, right? So let's say that you identify that you're better at endurance than you are at speed. You need to improve your speed, you'd like to improve your speed. You can do that. And there's a whole bunch of ways that you could do it. We're going to talk about improving your speed right now. This is just one. And you can take this kind of framework and, and apply it as needed. <clears throat> so you could take some classic training protocols like 10 by 100 meter run, 8 by 200, 6 by 400, for example. Uh, keep those distances constant, okay? And then you would, you would pick a target pace. And again, this is to improve your speed. So you would pick a pace that you want to have on each of those 200s, each of those 400s, each of those 100s, whatever it happens to be. And then your rest would stay constant and it would be ample enough, it would be long enough rest that you can go out and hit that target pace again because you're trying to run a little quicker than you're comfortable with, right? Because you want to train yourself to move faster. So you're going to train yourself to move faster. That's more demanding. It's not sustainable at this point in time. You're going to need more recovery. So you would play until you found what was those recovery periods that you could maintain that pace. And then you would just play this back and forth game of when that becomes now <clears throat> even more sustainable, well then what you could do is you have, you would keep the rest constant once again and you would slightly increase that pace. So maybe you're doing six by 400 meter repeats and let's say that your target pace is to do each one of those at a, a minute 45. Like that's appropriately challenging. You're out of your comfort zone, but you can do it. And to do it, you have to rest, let's just say three minutes between each one of those. And you do that and you're doing other things as well. And you do that and you retest it and you know, a week, a month, whatever it happens to be later, it wouldn't be a week, a month or more later, you're able to keep those 145 splits with the three minutes rest and it feels easier than it ever has before to keep that pace with that rest. Well, then you've got a couple options. You can then either keep the rest at three minutes but knock those paces down from 145 to 140 and again make it appropriately challenging. You're increasing your speed, you're forcing yourself to run faster, the rest has stayed constant until that becomes, again, comfortable. Again, you can keep playing that until you hit your threshold. <coughs> or you could play with the rest, which we'll talk about here in a second. Now, let's say that the opposite is true. You've got some speed. You're actually pretty quick, but you lack endurance. This may or may not apply to you, but a lot of CrossFit athletes fall into this camp. And now some people might be like, well, that's not me. I'm not fast. I'm not Usain Bolt we're not talking world record times. We're talking if we if we looked at a bunch of people's 200 meter times, 400 meter times, and then their 5K times, most people's 200 meter runs in CrossFit anyway, because there's a lot of high power, short burst stuff that we do, their 200 meter times and their 400 meter times, even if you feel like they're not that bad, again, this might not apply to you, but from a lot of CrossFit athletes, are probably more in line with where they should be than their 5K times, okay? Their 5K times are probably like, ooh, like, okay, maybe you get some work to do in the 200, we could tune it up. Yeah, you're 400, not bad. We could, you know, we could make it a little bit better. Then you see the 5K and you're like, oh, right. Um, let's not worry about the 200s and the 400s right now. This is where the issue is. Again, might not be you, but, but it's quite common. So if you are somebody that your speed is actually okay, but your problem is that you're, you don't have the endurance, you can't sustain it. Well, there are other things that we can do as well. And again, there's many, but here are just some. Going back kind of the same runs we talked about a second ago, 10 by 100, 8 by 200, 6 by 400, etc. Pick a target pace, just like we talked about earlier, but it's not a maximal pace, okay? Because you're already fast, okay? But it's going to be uh, a sub-maximal pace, still slightly challenging, but it's not going to be profoundly challenging because we want you to go longer on this. What we would do with this cohort of people 
who are decently fast but need to work on their endurance, is you would note the rest, keep the rest constant, and then you would do one of either two things. You would either add volume, uh, so you could say you're doing six 400 meter repeats at whatever pace was appropriate for you, you're resting three minutes between each, well now next week you're going to do seven 400 meter repeats instead of six or eight. So we're going to stretch out the volume and force you to get comfortable working for a longer period of time. The rest has stayed static, the pace has stayed static. Uh, or we could take a different approach. We're going to keep six 400 meter repeats. We're going to keep the pace that you've been running. But now in a few weeks, instead of taking three minutes rest between each, we're going to take two minutes and 45 seconds rest or two minutes and 30 seconds rest. So we're decreasing your recovery period there. The work periods are getting closer together and little by little you're getting used to working longer at that uh, target pace. Uh, let's see. And you could also do a little bit of both as well. You could also make the rest active. So maybe you've got the six 400 meter repeats, you've got three minutes of rest between each, but now instead of just casually walking during the three minutes, you're going to slow jog. So you're still taxing yourself more aerobically than you would if you were just walking. And so you're slowly starting to try to build up that endurance that will allow you to go longer and longer. So point being, there's a whole lot of different ways that we could that we could attack this. So let's see. Um, yeah, so I think that will be, <coughs> again, my apologies, my kids got me quite sick, uh, but I'm feeling much better right now. So there's a whole different lot of ways that we could attack this, and I wish I could remember, was it CrossFit, uh, Lynchpin, it was Lynchpin Conversations number 140? Let me see if I can find this, Lynchpin Conversations 140. I think this is what it was. Yes, okay. I would recommend Lynchman Conversations number 140, which is all about understanding rest intervals during uh, training, and that will significantly help people looking to make some of the decisions that I just spoke about. So again, Lynchman Conversations number 140 will treat you right. All right, let's see. Let's get on to our Lynchman shoutouts. Since my baby is still asleep, it's fantastic. So this one was called Real Life, Adjust, and Make It Happen from Matthew H. It says, today was a nobody cares, train harder day for me. Tiny human is cutting molars, the baby's cutting molars, and just had a day, day after getting sent home from daycare. Spent most of the day working with one hand while cuddling and watching Disney movies, but I was determined to get in some fitness after missing, missing yesterday's 5K due to some yard work. Everyone's talk of Lynchman Test 13 got me fired up about my favorite test, Lynchman Test 5. So he combined the 5K and the squats and did a front squat and stroller run version. Little human got some fresh air and I get in the workout. So very cool. Mixed a couple workouts together, made it happen with the baby, pushing in the stroller, real life, Fitness was achieved. Absolutely love it. Oh, next one here is from Ken T. This occurred a couple months ago. It's called Scaled September. Ken said, Not sure if anyone is interested in joining me, but I'm doing Scaled September. All month, I will either scale the weight, scale the reps, go not for time, sub in an odd object, or somehow otherwise deviate from the prescribed workout. Feels good to hit the reset button and take things back to mechanics, consistency, and intensity. I loved it when some members of the community did scaled September. They just scaled everything in one way, shape, or form for the whole month. What a, just a great way just to take some pressure off yourself and have some fun working out again. Anything which aids in consistency is a good thing. Okay, final one from Ivy. And this is entitled, Pregnancy Decisions. <clears throat> Another baby one. I've been such a, oh, I've been such a baby, sorry, she called herself a baby. 
I've been such a baby this week when it comes to working out since the pregnancy, exhaustion, and morning sickness seems to get worse. My husband always reminds me that I will feel better after I do it, which gives me much dislike towards him. She put a little smiley face there, so she's joking. Today I saw my husband doing McGee, and I was like, holy mother of all mothers, how am I going to do that? My husband was kind enough to suggest that I can do 20 minutes instead of 30 because it was a rough workout. I told him I'll see how I feel. I tried deadlifting 135 first and told myself, not today, so I scaled it down to 105. I did the knee push-ups and box step-ups. I did, I really did scale it to my comfort level and that was a great decision. I didn't die, I felt fine afterwards, and I was able to do the 30-minute time domain. Fitness was achieved. So again, real life, everybody has something going on. There are very few of us that are just sponsored athletes that have nothing to do but work out all darn day. Life, work, kids, stress, all kinds of other things going on. Give yourself some grace, pump the brakes a little bit, Remove the ego, make some smart decisions, and do whatever is appropriate for you that day. That's a win. Consistency pays off in the long run. Not any one particular day that has to be a home run. The victory is all these small battles. Every day, the small battle. That leads to winning the war. So that's it. Thanks to everybody for being awesome. I hope you enjoy your rest day. Life got away from me yesterday. I didn't get to do the running and the front squats. So that's on my agenda for today. And we will talk later.